All right, if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Proverbs chapter number 2. Proverbs chapter number 2, we started going through the book of Proverbs, preaching through it. And as we consider these passages, I hope that you understand that we can't be completely exhaustive with all of these, these verses, but we're trying to get some of these themes that are in the book of Proverbs. The collection of books that you have, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, those, those will be considered the wisdom books in the Bible. Of course, they were written by the wisest man, humanly speaking, Solomon, the son of David. Proverbs chapter number 2, let's start in verse number 1. We'll read down through verse 11. We'll have prayer and then we'll get into the message tonight. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid, hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints." Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Lord, we pray that you'd bless the preaching of your word tonight. Lord, we do thank you that we're able to come to church. We thank you, Lord, that we have the Bible we can open. And we still have freedom to be able to worship here today and we thank you for that Lord we don't want to take it for granted we pray God you might impart some wisdom from this book of wisdom to us God I pray that we'd listen and maybe hear beyond just man's voice and maybe hear your voice through the message and through the words of this precious book we thank you so much for it thank you for our Savior Jesus Christ it's in his name we pray amen, amen. the word proverb is from the Latin word Proverbium, which is a set of words put forth. Or it could be a saying supporting a point. Or you could take the word and break it down pro instead of and verba, words, which will be like a short statement that takes the place of many words. And we talked about it some last week, how that you have these small statements that are chuck full of experience and wisdom beyond man's wisdom. And that's what we're going to see as we go through the book of Proverbs, and spe especially here in chapter number 2, because it deals with seeking after wisdom, but then as we get to the end of the chapter here, you'll notice that there is this overall theme of the protection that wisdom brings. And that's kind of the theme tonight. I really have just three words. We'll look at those three words and uh, hopefully learn some things here from Proverbs chapter number 2. Um, now there are four categories of people we're going to see in Proverbs as we go through this. And we've covered some of these. You will have a fool. This is a man who knows not and cares not that he knows not. <laughs> That's a fool. He, he doesn't care that he's you know, walking into the telephone pole. He just does. Avoid him. Then you have a simple man, a man who knows not, but knows not that he knows not. Teach him. If he'll learn, teach him. He's ignorant, but he can learn something. Then you have a man who knows, but has forgotten that he knows, and he's simply asleep. Wake him up. Uh, Paul talks about uh, Christians that are asleep. He says it's high time to wake out of sleep. He says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, Ephesians chapter 5, and Christ shall give thee light. And so you find that exhortation. That's why there's so much repetition, I think, in Proverbs. He's like, you didn't get it the first time. Hey! So we have that. Then we have a wise man, a man who knows, and he knows that he knows. You need to follow that guy. Get behind him and follow him. And of course, we know the Lord is that man. 
Now we know that when man sinned in the Garden of Eden and the sin virus, if you want to call it that, which is worse than the coronavirus, the sin virus, passed upon all men and we have this fallen state of man's intellect. Uh, we are bent, all of us, on folly. We're all bent on folly. Who doesn't want a peanut butter jelly sandwich and sit down and watch a cartoon? <laughs> or whatever else stupid that you want to sit down and amuse yourself with. Amuse. A is always negate. So you take, uh, you, 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 know what I'm, you know where I'm going with that. Anyway, it's like uh, the idea of, of just amusing yourself, just sitting and being foolish. And the mind is bent, the intellect is bent on folly. And so what it takes in the regeneration when you're saved is the Holy Spirit to quicken your conscience and to help us along those lines. Your emotions run rampant, and in one area your will will be so weak that it just falls for whatever sin is, is presented with. In the other area you can be very stubborn. There's some stubborn people in this church, and I'm one of them. We're all stubborn in some areas. But a wise person will learn and admit that we don't know it all. When you finally get to that place where you think you know it all, now it's time to start learning something. <laughs> now let's look at these three words. The first one in verses 1 through 4, the word desire. Desiring wisdom. Desiring wisdom. The conditions for acquiring wisdom. He says in verse number 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. So receiving it when it's given. The idea is that Solomon's going to, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, give these verses, give these proverbs, give these sayings for people who want it. I'm kind of wore out with this modern age that's got to entertain Christians. You know, I didn't have a video clip up here of some movie to start off the sermon tonight. I know you're disappointed. We didn't have a bouncy ball leading the songs. We didn't even have songs. I know you're disappointed. Um, but the idea of having to entertain constantly. No, if you want to learn, you will take your eyes and you will read words out of a book. Well, preacher, that's a King James Bible. I can't understand that. How many things in your college curriculum did you really understand? Or did you actually have to increase your vocabulary a little bit? I wonder when you went to training with your job if there were any new terms you had to learn. And you didn't complain about that. Surely there's some archaic words in the Bible, of course. There's some phrases and stuff that we don't use anymore. Put on your thinking cap and step up to the plate. The idea is that God has given His truth and He expects us to take a book and read it and when we assemble together to have preaching based on the Bible. I'm not going to stand up and just read the Bible 24 hours a day to you. Preaching is more than just reading the Bible. However, God expects us to receive the Word. That's what He says in Thessalonians. He says, when we came to you, He goes, uh... uh we, he says, we came not in, in excellency of a man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. But he said, he said, you received our words not as the words of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. The Thessalonians received what they were saying. You ever talk to somebody, you can tell they ain't listening, or they don't want to hear what you're saying? They just start looking away or like, Whatever. And some Christians are that way. God says, do you want the truth? you got to listen. A.W. Tozer, the old preacher, he said, Why is it that man with drastically limited wisdom insists on making all the decisions in his life while a good portion of the time he is wrong? <laughs> you realize how many times we blow it? Somebody said, we, on, we hear only half of what is said to us. Understand only half of that. Believe only half of that. And remember only half of that. Now I do understand along these lines of modern age that you will be captivated more with an experience of seeing audio, visual, you know, $500 million movie project. That's going to keep your attention a whole lot better than a man standing up saying, the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Don't you love God? You know that you're already asleep. 
As soon as I hear a voice like this, it makes me sleepy. If you want to go to sleep on Sunday afternoon, listen to a good documentary. And it will put you to sleep like some sing-song preachers as they preach. And I understand that, so we try to sometimes get a little loud. We try to use a little bit of entertainment. Not that we're here to entertain you, but we want to keep your attention. But we're not going to put up some movie screen here. The idea is God gave words to instruct us by, and that's the basics. I know people that don't even spell anymore. They have their little texting language now. They're not teaching cursive. I understand the, the devolution of, of uh, words and intellect and all that kind of stuff. But the idea is to receive the truth and wisdom when it's given. You're going to see this a little bit later on, but wisdom cannot be learned. That seems like a contradiction because wisdom is a gift. If any man lack wisdom, James chapter 1, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It has to be received, not learned in that sense. Somebody said this, talk to people about themselves and they'll listen for hours. <laughs> See, if you're interested, you'll listen. Now, if I got up here and I said, turn to Revelation, or like some people say, Revelations. I went to Walmarts last night, so turn to Revelations. <laughs> That's my pet peeve. It's not Revelations. It's the book of Revelation. But if I turn there and I say, oh, we're going to study how all these prophecies are being for some of you, your ears would perk up and you say, oh, I want to hear what's going on. I love that. But I say, all right, we're going to study First Chronicles. You're like, First Chronicles. <laughs> if you're interested, so if your heart, if God begins to deal with your heart about truth and about your life and relationship to Him, you will start being interested in the Bible. A good sign that a Christian is growing is that he wants to read his Bible and he's interested in it. That's a good sign. Somebody said an open ear is the only believable sign of an open heart. You see that heart and mind are connected. And I think when we're saved, obviously we have the Holy Spirit to quicken our, our minds and hearts to help us to be able to learn. But here we talk, we're talking about desire. He says in verse number 2, So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searches for her as hid treasure. Search for it when you don't see it, verses 3 and 4. Like mining for silver. They go down and they mine that stuff out. They dig for it. Um, A.B. Simpson, an old-time preacher, he said this, God has hidden every precious thing in such a way that it is a reward to the diligent, a prize to the earnest, but a disappointment to the slothful soul. All nature is arrayed against the lounger and the idler. The nut is hidden in its thorny case. I love those paper shell pecans. You know what I'm talking about? The, well, isn't that what they call them, paper shell? You know, the real thin ones because you can bust them open easy. Man, that thing's too hard to get into. I ain't going to waste my time trying to open that. That's what he's saying. All nature is arrayed against the lounger and the idler. The nut is hidden in its thorny case. The pearl is buried beneath the ocean waves. The gold is imprisoned in the rocky bosom of the mountains. The gem is found only after you crush the rock which encloses it. The very soul, soil gives its harvest as a reward to the industry, to the laboring husbandman. So truth and God must earnestly be sought. And we've lost that. Nobody wants to seek God. They just want to sit and be entertained. John Wesley wrote this, I am a creature of a day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit coming from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf. A few months hence, I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. God himself hath condescended to teach the way. He hath written, down, written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. Amen. People running around like the testimony earlier. People just panic. They're freaking out. They're doing all this stuff. They're not seeking God. You would think 
The country's getting ripped apart. People start saying, hey, let's have a day of prayer. Let's get all, instead of closing the churches, let's open them up or let's at least tell everybody to pray and to repent of our wickedness. That's not going to happen because this country's not seeking after God. It would offend somebody if you said you're seeking after God. Nobody's seeking after God. Mining it like silver, digging into the ground. You know, if you ever study the gold rush, you know, the 49ers and all that stuff, it is amazing when you study some of those stories because it's, sto it's not just a couple of them. Story after story after story, you'll read about these people that were just going out to make enough to come back and to get some business started or whatever. They get out there, next thing you know, you buy a shovel for $200, you buy a wheelbarrow for $300. I'm talking about, you know, long time ago stuff. And what happened was, and then they got all the, the, the places of ill repute, they've got all the drinking places, they got all the stuff, they drain all the money, they go out there, they blow the money, or they get their brains blowed out by somebody else trying to steal their claim, and they have all this stuff over greed and over gold. And they would leave their wives, leave their children, leave jobs, leave the east, leave their churches. Because there were no churches out there in the gold fields. They went west. Why is the west so... Uh, the brother mentioned in his testimony about, uh, thank God he's born in the south. Man, he could be locked up for saying that probably. Anyway... <laughs> out west, why is it so bad out west as far as the gospel goes? Because they went out west looking for gold, not God. A lot of people came over here and founded America looking for God, trying to get away from oppression because they couldn't worship under the dictates of their conscience. Well, search for it like mining for silver. And then follow, follow it like a treasure map. Notice in verse number 4, If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, chase after it like you're going to find a treasure. You know, that's kind of the sentiment. I was reading some book by a historian, and he was talking about the, the, kind of the age of the, um, the Bible conference movement and the fundamentalist movement back in the, the, uh, the early 1900s all the way up into the 20s. And he was talking about some of those groups and things and how that they kind of had there was electricity in the air and the electricity was, was a, a desire to study the Bible and they would go out and they'd have these big conferences where people would travel and for weeks listen to people teach and preach the Bible from all over the country they'd have these things and then Bible, Bible institutes would spring up and you'd have things like that and he said it was almost like these people thought that the, the Bible was a, a treasure trove that they were going to find these, these things in the Bible that's how you ought to think about that Bible. That Bible is a treasure trove of truth. You turn the pages and stuff jumps off of it you've never seen before, and you've read it over and over and over. It's an amazing book. Follow it through like searching for treasure. I was reading about a man who found some treasure in, I think it was 1985, off of uh, Key West down there. It was the uh, Nustra Sonora de Atacha, I can't pronounce it, a Spanish ship and um, it was sank in a hurricane in 1622 the mother load they call it what they get and all the, the the fines and the value of it turned out to be close to 450 million dollars and he had to fight the government uh, he had to go to court and everything they were going to try to take it and I think he actually won and then he he uh, probably uh, he might have lived another five or six years and he had to die and go into eternity. But <laughs> the idea was that for 17 years, I think, he had been looking for this and trying to find this thing. And people get, I mean, modern day, I saw a documentary the other day about these modern day treasure hunters. You wouldn't believe the sponsors they have to get, the money they have to invest, and they have to get these ships. They have all this special equipment, the sonar equipment and different things. It's not as easy as you think it is just to go and start reading, you know, five miles deep in the ocean and all. And they have all this that has to go into it. And they are driven. They are passionate. They lose sleep. They plan. They work. For what? Just a little bit of money. They're going to put food in their mouth, just like somebody that doesn't have money. They're going to put clothes on their back, probably a little more expensive clothes. They're going to lay down. They're going to go to sleep. Maybe in a little nicer house. 
Follow it like a treasure map. We should follow through looking for wisdom, seeking after wisdom. So the first thing is desire, the desire of wisdom. Then notice in verses 5 through 11, the delight of wisdom. So there's some things, some contentment that comes when you get it. He says in verse 5, Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. So if you seek after it, if you search out it, if you're serious about it, this reminds me of what I was going to say earlier. There was an older man that was like a Bible teacher for years and years and years. I think it was Moody Bible Institute. I was reading about. And um, he had been teaching for a long time, and I think he was basically retired. He was doing some different meetings and so forth. And a young man had, not a young man, but a young convert came to him. And this young convert was an older man that had been converted. And he came and he says, look, give me some pointers. I'm, I'm newly saved. I want to learn the Bible. I want to know the Bible like you do. And the guy said, I'm sorry, but you're too late. He said, it took me a lifetime to learn the Bible like I know it right now. He wasn't trying to be rude to the guy. Talk about a sucker punch, man. Poof. But in some respects, think about it. Think about all the time and energy you have put in your mind and focus on things that have nothing to do with God or nothing to do with wisdom. Think about how many cells some of you have burned up on other things. Myself included. I find it a whole lot harder now at nearly 50 years of age to memorize portions of the Bible than I did when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, even 30. I wish I would have memorized a lot more. Back before the COVID-19 dispensation, <laughs> when we had the nursing home ministry, <laughs> I got that from somebody. I didn't come up with that. Before the COVID-19 dispensation, we were enjoying the nursing home ministry. We were all getting back into it again. We'd been out of it for a while. And uh, I had used to, we used to go to the other nursing home. I hardly ever looked at a hymn book. I know all the words. But man, we started this thing back up, and I'm getting up there playing, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to jump back in there, just pull those arrows out just like they're always there. There's nothing there. And I'm up there singing and playing. I'm like, I better run back and look at the verse again. You forget the hymns. I might remember the choruses, but do you really remember all those third stanzas? Everybody skips over the poor old third stanzas. The Lord, when we get to heaven, is going to line everybody up. And he's going to get John Newton as the choir director. And he's going to make all the churches through all the years sing all of those poor little third stanzas that these sorry musicians or uh, song leaders have left out. But Brother Chris always sings the third stanza. We appreciate it, Brother. <laughs> Amen. When we do get to sing again, we will have a special Sunday, I promise you. Delight. Notice the contentment that comes, verses 5 and 11. He says, then shalt thou understand. If you seek, if you go after it, you'll get it. For the Lord, verse 6, here it is, giveth wisdom. So he is the giver. It is a gift. We know every good gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men. So it's a gift, but you've got to want it. And you know, the funny thing about a gift is you can refuse a gift. And, or you can not appreciate a gift. Somebody walks up and they give you a, a book this thick on the history of some county in Missouri that you've never been to. And they're like, here, I thought you might enjoy this. Thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? You're probably not going to stay up all hours of the night reading it. Drink coffee to make sure you can be awake so you can read it. No. But a gift comes from God, but you've got to get it. He says, then will you get it. Notice, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, a buckler to them that walk up rightly. He, it holds you together. It gives you stability. Notice um, your perception. Verse number 5. You understand the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord leads us to trust, and trust leads us to love. All those things are connected. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then notice not just uh, understanding your place, because you realize God's God. Here's one thing I know about prayer. I know that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. But sometimes we don't really know the will of God. So we ask, and we seek, and we knock. And we try to move mountains and we pray and we say, God, we're, we're asking for this. We're praying. We're trying to find favor with God. But one thing I understand is my place, I am not God. And it's, it's humbling to realize that sometimes, but we have to understand 
that we are just a small little speck on, of, of a nothing. Who am I that a king should bleed and die for? Now, I think we get the wrong estimation of ourselves. That's why we don't fear God. God could take you in five seconds and pull all the breath out of your body. He could take your skin and turn it inside. You could walk out of here and have a disease worse than coronavirus. Just like that, if, you, if he wanted to. God's God. You could lose your mind before you got out of this church tonight. We don't, have a, we don't understand our place. And then notice, not only understanding our place, but he says in verse number uh, three, uh, 5, understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, knowing his person. The knowledge of God. I was reading about a, uh, a group of seminarian students, seminary students, and they didn't have a gym at their little school, so they went to this public gym to play basketball. And they're probably out there practicing, you know, their Greek alphabet and so forth and out there doing their stuff. They saw this old uh, janitor. He's waiting for them to finish up so he can go and, and sweep the floor. It's a black guy, and he's had white hair, just an old guy. They saw him over there reading. And as one guy was, was shooting and stuff, he went over there and he said, hey, what you reading? And he saw it was a Bible. And he really got kind of interested. Yeah, what you reading there? And he said, the man said, the book of Revelation. So the young seminary student, he thought he was going to be all smart and say, okay, you know, Let's find out if this guy knows anything. He goes, well, tell me, what is the correct interpretation? What does the book of Revelation mean since you're reading the book of Revelation? The old black man, he looked up, didn't even miss a beat. He says, it means Jesus wins. <laughs> Jesus wins. You know, you might not have all your doctrine right, but you need to know God. Right. And there's some Christians that they don't have, know how to uh, uh, split the dispensations, rightly divide everything. They might not have everything all right, but they are trying to please God. They're seeking after God. They fear God, and they know God. That's a blessing. Not just our perception, but our preservation. Verse number 11, this is really kind of the theme. Wisdom protects you. Verse number 11, discretion shall preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. And I'm not going to get into current events, but I will say this. If you're not in a bad place doing a bad thing, you don't have to worry about a bad cop. There are some bad cops out there. But if you're not in a bad place doing a bad thing, you ain't got to worry about that. Uh, if you're with bad people doing bad things, you're going to have some bad things happen to you. Wisdom will protect you. And there are some things, if you'll make a big decision... You'll make a big decision, other decisions will follow, and it'll be, everything will be safe. Young people make a decision to be pure when they come to the marriage altar. Certain other decisions will just be taken care of. There won't be any, any alone time where you can get into trouble because that decision's already been made, you see. So these decisions, we make a decision, okay, there's certain things I'm not going to compromise as far as my family goes, as far as my uh, beliefs go, so therefore other decisions, it just, it's just a lot safer that way. Your preservation. Picture a cat. I know that some of you really love cats. One thing you've got to admire about a cat, you can take a cat and kick him out of a... Kick him off the, knock him off the top of a, a deck 15 feet off the ground, and he's going to land on his feet. You can watch a cat fall out of a tree, and he will land on his feet. I mean, it's an amazing thing. But you'll watch cats sometimes, and you can picture a cat in an alley, and here's all these busted bottles and sherds and stuff, and maybe even old needles and stuff poking out there. Here's this cat walking, and the cat puts its paw down just so gingerly, and then just makes sure before it, it's, it's disc very discreet. Just very careful. Discretion. Wisdom. God will give you that wisdom will you, before you commit, before you open your mouth and insert foot. Let me think about what I'm about to say. Let me think about what I'm about to do. Long-term repercussions here. Wisdom will give you, it'll protect you. Your preservation gives you stability. Discretion is counting the cost. And notice in the text, verse number uh, 10, or verse number 9, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. You don't have to worry about a Christian, a good Christian, 
being fair and equal and non-prejudicial. You don't have to worry about that. You follow God and you follow the Bible, you'll have stability. Wisdom and goodness, William uh, Cowper said this, Wisdom and goodness are twin-born. One heart must hold both sisters, never seen apart. They go together. Finally, the last thing here, verses 12 through 22, and we'll be done. Notice deliverance, the consequences of acquiring wisdom. Verse number 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. So we have deliverance. So really when you think about it, God says, if you want wisdom, I'll give it to you. And then when you get it, there's some things that's going to follow. And if you'll put these things into practice, these things will happen. You will get this by wisdom. And the main idea behind this tonight is protection, discretion. He says, to deliver thee. God will deliver you. Look at it, verse number 12. From the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths. You know, there are, there are bad people out there. There are wicked people out there. So how dare you make an assumption or a judgment? No, the Bible makes that judgment. When you open up the Bible, it immediately divides. In Genesis, he divides the light from the darkness. And before you even have the sun and you have light as we know it, he's dealing with spiritual light and spiritual darkness because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And so we obviously have a division between God and the devil. We have a, a, a division between good and evil, between righteousness and wickedness. Now, once you say there is a division, there is a moral balance, or I should say a moral authority, now you have to say, where does this particular thing fall? So when you hear something, when someone acts a certain way, when someone does a certain thing, then immediately you, based on the Bible, make a judgment. Oh, I can't believe you said judge. Make an assessment. And you say, that's right or that's wrong. And there are things in this Bible that are said to be wrong and bad and wicked that you and I enjoy. I'm glad I got a few amens out of that. The problem is we have a bad, wicked nature and we like bad things. That's why the social media platform so popular and the news and all the stuff about everybody else's life is so popular because people like to hear stuff about other people. It's a natural tendency of fallen man to hear things about other people. So they can look down on them. Very seldom or they want to look up and praise somebody else other than themselves. They normally want to pull their own ego up by pushing somebody else down. So therefore I want to hear something bad about somebody else. Or I want to hear some new thing and some new stuff so I can make a big deal of it or so I can tell somebody what I know that they don't know. That's really Gnosticism that you read about in the, in the book of Colossians when they, they had to go through that where people think they have the know. I've got more information. I'm a researcher. What does that mean? That means you sit around listening and watching YouTube all day. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you're studying scholarly works and you're actually researching. Maybe have a research team that's polling and doing assessments and actually studying logically statistics, it means you're sitting around reading blogs or YouTube or CNN or Fox News or whatever. Or Google. Or you ask Siri or Alexa or whatever woman goddess that you ask. You know, they're all women goddesses. I think it's where they get all their names or whatever. I don't know what they are. There are wicked people, and the problem is, you'll notice in the text, they rejoice to do evil. So what we have here, we have the proclamations, verse number 12. They speak bad things. I said it the other day. We do not have freedom of speech in America anymore. You can say certain things negatively and very, and very nasty and wicked things about Jesus Christ, and it can be on TV, and it can be in the movies, and they won't say nothing about it. That stuff's okay. But they're coming up with their own ideas of different things you cannot say regarding certain sins. And you say certain things about certain sins. Well, I just need to know who I am. Check the plumbing and find out. Amen. 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 It's a crazy world. 
Um, notice their proclamations, verse number 12, the things they say. Notice their paths, verse number 13. They left the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. They're going the wrong way. Bob Jones Sr. said you can always follow the right man on the right road anywhere. I'm paraphrasing. Somebody's going down the right road, you can always, the right road leads at the right place. You can always follow that man on the right path. Notice, not just their paths, but verse number 14, their pleasures. The things they actually get pleasure out of are bad. Here's how you know if what you're doing is not a sin. Is it, is it a legitimate pleasure or not? Well, there are several ways to know it, but a couple of things. Does it harm anyone else? Does it harm your testimony for Christ? Does it glorify God? Would you like God to find you doing it when He returns? That's a good one. It's like the guy trying to, trying to justify smoking cigarettes and all that, and the guy says, well, if you're smoking cigarettes, what are you going to do if the rapture happens? You take a big old inhale, and then the rapture happens, you get caught up to the Lord, and you're like... <laughs> he calls your name, and you're supposed to say, here, or present, you know? Here. Yeah. <laughs> like the one preacher used to say, you can uh, you can chew tobacco. You can chew tobacco. That's what they call it in the mountains. You can chew tobacco. You can chew tobacco and go to heaven, but you got to go to hell to spit. <laughs> got a big chaw in your mouth. The rapture happens. You get up there and you're like, "What are you going to do? Swallow it?" I know you're not going to take your physical body up there. Don't, don't correct me after the service. <laughs> Your glorified body will not crave nicotine. Praise the Lord for that. Or sugar, probably. All right. Now, notice their proclamations, their paths, their pleasures. They, they, they delight in doing bad. And then notice their perversions. Verse 15. Look at this. this if this is not prophetic, whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths. The opposite of crooked is straight. I don't know why that ever came up in this whole modern debate of wickedness that we're dealing with. I'm straight. I ain't, I ain't ashamed to say it. <laughs> Not crooked. That's the opposite of it. It's not a lifestyle. It's crooked. It's perversion. Now, let's look at the wicked women here. Notice in verse number 16, to deliver thee not just from the wicked man, but from the wicked woman. From the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the God of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Here's a wicked woman, and notice she's called a strange woman in verse 16. That's not like we would use the word, she's strange, you know, she's, you know, just strange. The idea in Bible times when it refers to strange, like when Solomon married many strange women, it says strange and outlandish. The word outlandish, well, he's just real outlandish. It meant outside of the land. So a stranger was someone that was not a Jew, typically. So this is some Gentile woman, kind of like the Moabites that came in. You remember the story there when Balaam tried to get God... Uh, to go against his people because he couldn't get God to curse them. So what he did is he manipulated Israel by turning the Moabite women toward the young men. They got them ensnared and then God began to punish them and judge them because they were committing fornication with outlandish women, women that were strange. So that's the idea here. Notice in the text though, we have her flattering in verse number 16. Flattering with her words. It's not communication, it's manipulation. Flattery is insincere praise that has an ulterior motive. Delilah says, Samson, you are so handsome. She says, Samson, you are just the love of my life. I've never loved a man like you. I've got big plans, me and you forever, you know, and they go to the tree and he carves it with his finger in a tree. He doesn't even need a knife, you know, just Samson and Delilah. Uh, but when you, you got to read in between the lines when all that stuff's going on there. You know, you, you just read it straight through the narrative. You know, she says, hey, you know, how do you, uh, how do you have all your strength? He says, you weave my hair together, and she weaves it. And the Philistines be upon thee, you know. you got to read in between the lines. There's, there's some days going on in between there. There's some times going on when she's, you know, she's really getting to him. The Bible says he loved Delilah. 
wasn't like the harlots and wasn't like all the women. He fell for her. And she flattered him with her words. She finally got, she goes, you don't really love me. Or you would have told me. Because really when you talk about intimacy, the Bible uses that word in the Old Testament. It says Adam knew Eve, his wife. The most intimate you can be is not just in the physical sense. It goes beyond that. You talk about conversation, you can go to work and you're sitting around a water cooler and say, Hey man, is it going to rain today? Yeah. Hey, did you see that dust storm? How many of you lived through the dust storm? Amen? Some of you say, what are you talking about? Don't even worry about it. It's gone. It's over. The Sahara Desert came to Florida and Georgia. Brother Chris says it was even a Moultrie the other day. He said, like, what is going on? So he came home and Googled it. <laughs> but uh, you're sitting around a water cooler and you just have that little casual conversation. That's not deep at all. But when you have a close friend, you begin to talk about things more than just the football scores, more than just what happened at church, or more than just what happened. When you have a real close friend, you talk about you know, how you feel. And you're willing to risk rejection knowing that even though they might disagree with you, you're still friends. A friend loveth at all times. A friend says, hey, go ahead and tell me. Do I need to dye my hair? <laughs> tell it to me straight. But somebody that's not a true friend, see, they're going to get all their feelings hurt. And they're going to fly out of coop and all that and the other. But when you move into the marriage, marriage bed and you move into the marriage relationship, the intimate relationship, the word no is used. And so it's a whole lot deeper than that. It's not this flattery stuff. This is, uh, that's manipulation. Flattery is insincere praise with an ulterior motive. And that's exactly what Delilah did to Samson. She was trying to get something from him. And then we notice not just her flattering, but we notice her forsaking in verse number 17. She forsaketh the God of her youth. This lady had some instruction early on. And you know, you think about some of these women that get into bad trouble, and you see them. I've seen them in the prisons. And you're sitting there thinking, man, I tell you what, when I used to deal with juvenile, juvenile girls were way worse than juvenile boys. Way worse. Never, anybody tell you that's ever worked with them. And you get to thinking sometimes, you say, man, that little... Well, that one, when you see them in the prisons, you think, man, this lady here was some woman's daughter or some woman's granddaughter, and she probably, maybe her grandmother held her in her arms and prayed over her when she was six months old. And here she is doing double life. What happened? You kids in here, we love every one of you. We've seen you come, we've seen you go, and some of them we've seen you stay and grow up, and that's a blessing. But some of them you really don't know until the cage door opens up. And I'm not being mean or anything, but you have boundaries, and you're supposed to have boundaries. But you're going to have to make a choice eventually on your own whether you're going to follow the paths of God, and you're going to listen to what mom and dad told you from the Bible, or you're going to forsake that counsel. This lady forsook the guide of her youth. Not just forsaking, but notice she forgets. Here's the thing about this. A pure young lady can always be like the wicked woman. The woman that's already lost her purity, a young lady that's pure can always be like that. But a lady that's already lost that can never be like that young lady. There's a forsaking, verse number 17. There's a forgetting, verse number 17. You know what I think that verse number 17 is, that forgetting? I think that's that searing out of the conscience. Just cutting that, just, I don't want to remember and you know how the mind works. The mind, you can, you can stimulate those memories. And you have to be careful with that. The battlefield is the mind. We have to cast down imaginations and every high thing that is all of itself against the knowledge of God. Bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you have to train that mind. And only by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ can you have forgiveness from Him and then forgiveness for yourself. This is a big place where a lot of people get off sideways and they even turn and get on these crazy ideas and go against the Bible itself because they're trying to sear out the conscience of a bad mistake, a bad sin they did years ago. Instead of putting it under the blood and getting forgiveness, they just try to forget it. Notice the fatalities, verse number 18, her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. Notice the future, verse 19, none that go into her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. It's a dead end street. Finally, verses 20 to 22, and we're done. 
We find wisdom gives discretion, discretion gives direction. So we really had four words. Our last word would be direction. The path of the wise man, verse number 20. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Notice the path of the wise man is marked by purity, verse number 20. And marked by protection, verse number 21. He will dwell in the land. And God will bless you if you will walk in the paths of the righteous. Obtaining wisdom isn't a once a week hobby. It's a daily discipline. There's a price. And I know I said you don't learn it and you don't buy it. It's a gift. But there's a price to pay in the sense of discipline. There's a price to pay in the sense of sacrifice. And I guess I could say, just repeating the first point, there's a price to pay in the sense of desire. Do you want it? And if you want God's wisdom, He'll give it to you. And I believe that the path of the just is the path that we should want to go on. There's a passage in Psalms, I can't remember the, the reference, where it talks about we have a goodly heritage. Y'all know that passage? We have a goodly heritage. Some of you young people in here, you have a goodly heritage. I look back and I think about my father. He got saved the year I was born, and he led me to Christ. And I could always look at my father's life as a testimony, and it helped me. I have a goodly heritage. Some of you, maybe you didn't have that, but you know what God's done? God's given you some Christian mentors. He's given you some Christian friends. He's given you some examples, maybe a grandmother years ago, somewhere, somewhere along the line. I know we like to get on Ancestry.com and find out how much Indian you got. She's got at least a 32nd. She's a 32nd she's a degree Indian. Um, her dad's got a 16th. But, supposedly, the best we can figure. I know we like all that stuff, but I like to trace, and now maybe that's because I'm a history buff, but I like to trace our godly heritage as far as our, the Christian heritage. And study some things as far as, you know, evangelicalism, if you want to call it that, and the fundamentalist movement, and, and Protestantism even, you know, as, as wide a range as that. I like to look at that and see how men and women of faith through the years with different challenges, similar to ours, just different times, how they stood up to it, how they got through it. Man, that encourages me. And I realize, you know what, I'm in that same line. That one told that one, and that one told that one, and that one told that one, and that one told that one. Here we are, over 2,000 years later, we have a goodly heritage. And that's a great path to walk on. And there's protection along that. That's the path I want to stay. It's the old path, Jeremiah chapter 6. It's a good way. I want to walk in that path. I'll be safe. I'll be protected. There's plenty of people walking the old path. Don't buy into the thing, you know, nobody does that no more. Nobody reads the Bible no more. The worst Bible on the market is the one that's not being read. And there's people still reading their Bible. There's people still praying. Let's walk in that old path and we'll find protection. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the scripture. What a treasure trove of truth this book is. Lord, this chapter is a great chapter. And I pray, God, you'd help us to realize there's a path that we need to walk in. Lord, if there's some here that have gotten away from that path, maybe they're about to go in the ditch. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to see the error of their ways. And we thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Lord, we don't have to uh, just revel in our wickedness and revel in our fallings and failings. We don't have to stay in the ditch. Lord, we thank you that you pick us up and put us back on the path. Lord, help us to walk in the paths of good men. I pray for these young people in here that you'd help them to follow the examples that are set before them, to walk in the way that's set, not to question it. Lord, uh, I know they have questions on their own. I understand that. But God, I pray that you'd help them to realize the tried and true path is going to protect them in the end. I pray that you'd help them. Lord, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for leading us and guiding us. We do pray that you'd bless our church family. Bless these were mentioned on the list tonight. We know a lot of folks have troubles that they might not even bring up. We pray, God, that you might meet the needs of these unspoken requests. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for this book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.